I am so very pleased to introduce from Beyond Nuclear in Tacoma Park, Washington, Mr. Kevin Camps, whom I have known since 2003, and we have worked together off and on all these years, and um, get ready to learn a bunch of stuff. Kevin? <laughs> Everybody. Thank you to Linda and Molly and the mothers for having me out. It's a tremendous honor. And um, I have 76 slides in 45 minutes. So I'm going to fly, especially through the first part, because it's mostly by way of introduction. So I was asked to talk about transportation risks with irradiated nuclear fuel. And I'll sort of introduce myself more as we go through the introduction. But my title at Beyond Nuclear is Radioactive Waste Watchdog. So my focus has been on irradiated nuclear fuel issues for a long time, and we can just get started. So um, this image is by Robert Del Tredici, who is based in Montreal, uh, Quebec. He's a longtime anti-nuclear activist. And the title of that book up there, The Whale and the Reactor, have, have anyone in the room read that book by any chance? So this was required re reading at um, Earlham College, where I went to undergrad. And it made a big impression on me. And one chapter was about Diablo Canyon. There was a lot of history about the protest movement out here. And so the reason I wanted to put this in is just to let you all know that I've known about Diablo Canyon for a long time. I've known about the stories. It's left a deep impression on me. And next slide. This uh, image was really what really struck a deep impression on me from the book. And this just appeared in a blog by NRDC, their response to the CPUC decision, their disappointment at the exclusion of support for the community, support for the workforce. And they included this image in their, um, their blog. And that was what was described in the book. The author of the book, um, whose name was on the previous slide, was up in the hills above Diablo Canyon looking out to sea and saw a whale go by when he was out there. And the, the point that the author made was, here's a technology that's 50 years old, putting at risk a species that is tens of millions of years old. And there's something not right about this. So here I was, you know, uh, 20 years old, taking this all in. And after college, I joined the Rock Across America for Mother Earth, which was mostly focused on the Nevada test site, nuclear weapons testing. It was a collaboration between the Western Shoshone Indian Nation, and here you have Corbin Hardy, the spiritual leader of the Western Shoshone, who's standing, and he passed on 10 years ago. And seated is uh, Chief Raymond Yao. And so um, it was a collaboration between the Western Shoshone Indian Nation and a Belgian anti-nuclear organization called For Mother Earth. And uh, we walked from New York City to Nevada, and some folks kept walking to the Pacific. And it was the 500th anniversary of Columbus's invasion, and it was all about shutting down the nuclear weapons testing. And it's the first time I heard about Yucca Mountain. It was 1992, um, the Screw Nevada Bill had passed into law five years earlier, singling out Yucca as the dump site in the country. And uh, that, that made a big impression on me, <laughs> being on that walk. So another, um, person I learned about in college at Earlham there was uh, this gentleman, David Brower. And a part of the history I learned from this book that a colleague loaned me about the, the anti-nuclear history in California, at least the early part, um, was that Brower left the Sierra Club because of the Diablo Canyon betrayal, essentially. That it went down behind his back, and that was enough for him. And he left and went to found Friends of the Earth, who you know, played a part in this agreement, the shutdown agreement. You know, and it's a mixed bag, the shutdown agreement, because I've been involved myself uh, in a number of challenges to license extensions. And it is so rigged, there's no way you're gonna stop it. So at Palisades in Michigan that I'll talk more about, at davis Fessy in Ohio, these very dangerous reactors that should be shut down now have been rubber stamped 20 year license extensions. The risks are just gonna worsen as time goes on. And so, um, yeah, so it's, you know, there's some good news to it that there's no way the Apple Canyon will operate into that 20-year extension, which is just uncharted danger zone. That so many reactors, there are 75 reactors, more than that in this country, that have gotten these 20-year license extensions. So we'll see how that goes. One of those is Oyster Creek, New Jersey, 
which is about to turn 50 years old. So they're about 10 years into their operations. They're supposed to shut down um, in 2019. But as, as you can see across the country, if they get bailed out, they'll keep going. They'll just keep that gravy train going if they can get away with it, despite the risks. So um, one of the jokes that David Brower put out there in, in the book, um, Encounters with the Arch Druid, which I also read in college, was a biography about him. He pointed out that brand new activists have the advantage of not knowing how impossible <laughs> you can get so much done. And that's quite to the contrary of the mothers who've been at this forever. So you know full well how impossible this all is. But just a couple examples of this principle. Um, up in the Great Lakes, where I'm from, stop the Great Lakes nuclear dump, which is essentially a couple and their friends. And the next slide, I'll show some of their work, um, trying to stop a radioactive waste dump targeted at the Lake Huron shoreline. Drinking water supply for 40 million people, the Great Lakes. Great place for nuclear waste dump. Um, another example is, oh, it didn't come through. Um, this group is called STL Moms, Just Moms St. Louis. And uh, Dawn Chapman and Karen Nickel are the founders, and they are trying to get the West Lake landfill cleaned up. This is Manhattan Project waste from you know, the earliest days of the Manhattan Project that's dumped in a residential community in a garbage dump, and the garbage dump is on fire. And um, just to put it on your radar, if you have access to HBO, on February 12th, I think it is, a major documentary about this struggle called Atomic Homefront is going to premiere on HBO. So it's going to tell the story of these two moms and the mountains they have moved on this issue. So this is the work of Stop the Great Lakes Nuclear Dump. They have gotten resolutions passed in all these places in red, including the city of Chicago, which is headquarters of Exelon Nuclear. Um, including the city of Toronto, which is headquarters of Ontario Power Generation, the dump proponent. They've, they've worked miracles to get these resolutions. It's such an insane proposal, especially on the U.S. side, that even the U.S. nuclear power industry is like, yeah, that's a bad idea to dump radioactive waste in the Great Lakes Basin. But there's really no good place, is there? So, but they've gotten resolutions from municipalities representing nearly 24 million people. This, this tiny grassroots group that's all volunteer, like you guys. So I said that I'm from Michigan. Uh, Palisades in Southwest Michigan is the reactor that I learned about a lot once I got back from that walk. I was blissfully ignorant growing up, but then I found out about it. And there's, there's some pretty significant overlaps between Diablo and Palisades. So you're seeing Palisades on the Lake Michigan shore in Southwest Michigan. That phrase, the monster up the beach, was uh, originated by the community just beyond those cooling towers called Palisades Park, a resort community that's now 115 years old, a couple hundred cottages. And Palisades Atomic Reactor took over the, the one end of that park and displaced some of the cottages and took the name from the park. And the folks there call it the monster of the beach. And so Diablo Boy's illustration there kind of gets that going too, especially the, the ironic name. And uh, this is another Southwest Michigan reactor, just 30 miles south of Palisades, called Cook, which it looks so much like Diablo to me, but it's on Lake Michigan. And then that great art from San Onofre. Next slide. So one of the overlaps between Palisades and um, Diablo that I wanted to point out is we've, we've made the issue of Palisades the single biggest safety issue of many to choose from, this reactor pressure vessel in Riddleman where the neutron flow from the nuclear reaction in the core has weakened the metal of the reactor pressure vessel, which is a major safety feature. If you lose the reactor pressure vessel, there's no contingency to prevent a meltdown. And then all you have left is the containment. And we saw how that went at Fukushima Daiichi. So it turns out this is a pressurized water reactor risk phenomenon, less applicable to boiling water reactors. But the worst in the country are on either side of Lake Michigan, Point Beach, Wisconsin, Unit 2, and Palisades. And then Diablo Canyon is also on that short list, uh, Unit 1. And this is another reason, like Linda said, to shut down Diablo as soon as possible. Uh, it turns out that uh, Rancho Seco, back in the 80s, suffered a, uh, a serious uh, incident involving this phenomenon, where um, the temperature change on the reactor pressure vessel suddenly decreased mightily because the emergency core cooling system was activated. And that's all it takes if you have an embrittled reactor. Fortunately, Rancho Seco was still new at that point, and the embrittlement hadn't proceeded to the point where it would fracture. 
but it's like a hot glass under cold water. Just add 2,000 pounds of pressure per square inch, and that's the risk. And so um, what the NRC has done over the decades is to weaken the regulations time and time again to keep these dangerously embrittled reactor pressure vessels operating. And um, we're in very much uncharted territory of Palisades right now on that issue. So if you want to learn more about this pressurized thermal shock reactor pressure vessel in Riddleman, when we tried to shut down Palisades in 2014 on this issue, we compiled a timeline and an archive of documentation going back to 1948 on this issue. So there's a place you can learn more. And I just wanted to tell this story because I'm supposed to talk about transportation. Uh, we had a series of meetings with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission a couple chairmen and I think three commissioners came through in the space of a couple, three years because of the noise we were making at Palisades about the risks. And Palisades had a very um, bad operational history right after Fukushima, which raised the profile in the media in a big way. So we got all this attention from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And both of these gentlemen, when they came through, had, had the um, misfortune of using car metaphors when they tried to calm us down. And we were all Michiganders at the table, so we know all about cars. So um, Chairman Yasko tried to say, it's like the warning light in your car. You don't have to take it right to the shop right away. You can take it in a week later, it'll be okay. And one of my colleagues, Kathy Barnes from Don't Waste Michigan said, without missing a beat, but Chairman, you can't kill a million people with your car. <laughs> and, uh, Commissioner Magwood tried to say, you know, it's like an old antique car. You just build it, you, you rebuild it from the inside out. That's what they're doing at Palisades. And of course, he had no idea, but we knew they haven't replaced anything. You know, the reactor pressure vessel is not replaceable. It would be cheaper to build a new reactor. The lid at Palisades, the steam generators, all these pathways to meltdown have not been dealt with. So we're in, you know, uncharted risk territory with a rogue agency that's just out of control as is the industry. So segueing into waste issues a, a bit. Um, so I know Molly gave a talk um, in this series about the basics of high-level radioactive waste, that it spends a lot of years in the pool, and then the pool fills up, and the older stuff can go out to the overflow parking in the parking lot in these dry casks. And a part of the problem with the pools, and there's another slide coming up about Fukushima Daiichi, is these are mega catastrophes waiting to happen. So they are outside of containment, at least the reactors are inside containment, but look what happened to Fukushima Daiichi. The containments were damaged or destroyed. Large-scale, catastrophic releases of radioactivity to the environment, but the pools are outside of containment. And so these are mega-catastrophes that could unfold into the environment. And so at Fukushima Daiichi, um, a very close call to a mega-catastrophe. Uh, there, there's been some uh, work published in recent months and years that showed how close it came at unit number four to a pool fire. And one thing to mention about unit four at Fukushima is there's so much less waste in the Japanese pools. At Fukushima Daiichi, they had a common pool at the ground, but each of the six units there, the elevated pools, only had so much waste in them, but the common pool had the most waste of all. So unit four had a lot of waste in it, but nothing like the U.S. pools, which are packed to the gills. And there's a lot of off-site transport in Japan to a proposed reprocessing facility up north, too. So, um, but if this pool had gone up, um, Prime Minister Khan, at, who was serving at the time, a year later admitted publicly that he had a secret contingency plan to evacuate Tokyo and northeastern Japan if that pool had gone up. So the evacuation that took place was 160,000 people. Those were the reactor releases from damaged containers. If that pool had gone up, up to 50 million people would have required evacuation to where? Mm -hmm. And the reason the pool did not go up in flames for, lo for loss of cooling was uh, damage to a gate between the reactor cavity and the storage pool. Was it the earthquake that damaged the gate? Was it the explosion? I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's been determined yet. But the edges of the gate failed. Water that happened to be in the reactor cavity flowed into the pool and prevented a fire. So, regulation by Guardian Angel. And every pool in the United States has this potential under the right circumstances that we can talk more about. So, uh, just some more risks of pools. I actually visited Fukushima Daiichi seven months before the catastrophe. 
and I was invited there to speak about pool risks. And uh, wouldn't you know, um, Diablo Canyon is on a short list of reactors in this country that have had pool leaks. And here's the documentation. It's from the Nuclear Waste Confidence Environmental Impact Statement proceeding that many of you probably engaged in out here. Public comment. And wouldn't you know that there are 13 pools in the United States and Diablo Canyon is on that list for having a pool leak. And they claim that it was contained within the pool area itself. It didn't leak to the environment, but it's not a short list you want to be on having a leaking pool. And these pools are degrading as time goes on. So um, there are other reactors in the country that are much worse in that regard, and that's why I was invited to Fukushima Daiichi, was mostly to talk about Indian Point near New York City, which has had serious leakage of radioactivity from its pool right on the edge of the Hudson River for a long time. So other risk categories, um, the movement of these heavy loads when the waste is coming out of the pool going into dry cast storage. You have loads that weigh 100 tons moving over the pool, and if one were to drop, you could puncture the pool and release the cooling water, and you would be into a catastrophic emergency in a short period of time, because the waste will heat up, catch fire, and then escape into the environment. The cesium-137 is highly volatile. Other pathways to loss of cooling, loss of grid power, natural disasters, intentional attacks. Here's an image of waste being moved around in a pool. That's a single assembly being moved. So here's some images of dry cask storage in a vertical or a horizontal orientation. Some artist's renditions to give you an idea of how big they are. And then um, what, what needs to happen? Um, the pools, my point is the pools need to be empty as soon as possible because of the dangers involved. Unfortunately, high burn-up fuel requires a lot of time in the pool before it's capable of being moved to dry cask storage. So back in 2002, a group called Citizens Awareness Network in the Northeast convened a meeting, Molly came out, uh, to try to come up with an alternative to the bad Yucca Mountain plan that was about to come up for a vote in the US Congress. And Dr. Arjun Makajani coined the phrase hardened on-site storage. He's with Institute for Energy and Environmental Research. And the same group can commission Dr. Gordon Thompson with Institute for Resource and Security Studies in Cambridge, Arjun's in Tacoma Park, um, to look at this idea of hardened or robust storage to make the dry cask storage significantly better than it is because there's lots of problems with it, to get the pools empty. Next slide. And so uh, over the course of years, uh, in 2006, the first iteration in 2010, an update, we hammered out an environmental cons a consensus across the United States. A couple hundred, 300 groups on this thing representing all 50 states. And here are some of the, the basic criteria. Essentially, um, empty the pools, um, certainly reduce the amount of waste in them. Yes, dry cask storage, but with significant safety and security upgrades. Things like monitors for temperature, for pressure, for radioactivity, so that you know if there's a problem going on and can know about it instantly. They don't have any of this right now. It's not required. Uh, fortifications against terrorist attack. Um, funding streams so that local stakeholders, like our own groups or local governments, can monitor the situation. And uh, in the update, we uh, added reprocessing, anti-reprocessing, because there was a major push under George W. Bush to revive reprocessing. It's, and something we'll have to guard against present day. So here are some of the California groups, including the mothers who signed on to the Statement of Principles. And if you want to check out the statement, there's, there's the link. And this will be posted online, so if you need to refer back to all these links. So here's um, Dr. Gordon Thompson's paper, the graphic there, his depiction of what hardened on-site storage could look like. And I often uh, add the caveat, and the Statement of Principles is intentionally vague because this is a broad coalition. The details of each site differ, so it's going to have to be a site-specific approach. Um, there are some places where hard on-site storage is not appropriate. Prairie Island, Minnesota, a Native American reservation in the floodplain of the Mississippi, is often pointed to as a top example of an inappropriate place for atomic reactors to be, for dry cask storage to be, and even hardened on-site storage. So to higher ground, further inland, away from the floodplain, away from earthquake fault lines, and uh, fortified against attack. 
And so out this way with the Sam and Ofri situation, there's so much clamor. Get it out of here. We don't care how it leaves. We don't care where it goes. Just get it out of here. And I got a, a letter to the editor in the Los Angeles Times a couple months ago where I said, okay, how about Camp Pendleton Marine Corps Base? How about instead of sending it, and Diane's going to talk about these proposals for centralized interim storage facilities in places like New Mexico, Texas, how about moving it a few miles to the east to Camp Pendleton mm -hmm. instead of a thousand miles to the east? Mm -hmm. And you'd have the added advantage besides getting away from rising sea levels, away from earthquake fault lines, out of the tsunami zone, to having the largest concentration of U.S. Marines in the continental United States to help guard it. What a bonus. So uh, a point about hard non-site storage is it is necessary and inescapable because there's no magic wand. Diablo Canyon is still operating, hopefully for not much longer, but what does it mean when you're still operating? It means you're at the back of the line for exporting your waste. Even San Onofre, just shutting down four years ago, is pretty far back in the line. There are much older reactors, right here in California, even Humboldt, um, Rancho Seco, that are much closer to the front of the line for getting the waste out if there was somewhere to go. But there is nowhere to go. The Department of Energy, its latest estimate for when a repository, a deep geologic repository, can open in the US is 2048, mid-century. And hence these proposals for centralized interim storage. Let's get it done quickly. Let's get it out of here. Let's transfer the title and liability. It's off the ledgers of the nuclear utilities. It's on to the DOE, the Department of Energy, which means taxpayers. That's what's driving this. And the public relations coup that they could say the waste problem is solved. So it has to happen, regardless of developments at Yucca or centralized interim storage. These upgrades have to happen on site or near site. So here's the whole tech casks deployed at that Cook nuclear power plant in southwest Michigan, right on the <clears throat> lake shore of Lake Michigan, drinking water supply for 40 million people. And we'll talk some more about the whole techs. I had the honor of working with Oscar Sharani, who was an industry whistleblower from Exelon Nuclear and Commonwealth Edison, who was top of his profession, quality assurance inspection. And Exelon use, uses Holtex. He was tapped because of his impeccable credentials to lead a quality assurance inspection on the Holtec containers, which are dual purpose, on-site storage and transport. So this is beginning to segue into the transport risks. Oscar led a team of a dozen inspectors from all of these utilities called the Holtec Users Group, different nuclear utilities that use these containers. These containers are used at 33 different reactor sites in the country, including here at Diablo, soon to be at San Onofre. And what they found in a long weekend of inspections, and this was in the year 2000, a couple months after the Nuclear Regulatory Commission had done a quality assurance inspection itself and found no problems, they found rampant problems. They found nine categories of problems. And the one that I point to just as an example is the welding. They had unqualified welders doing the welding on these containers. They were rushing the cooling on the welds in cold water baths putting fans on them, putting them in air-conditioned rooms to speed the production process, to meet a production quota. And so Oscar Sharani um, tried to get a stop work order at Exelon, and it cost him his job. He was run out of the company for, for blowing the whistle on this, and he was blacklisted from the US nuclear power industry for the rest of his life. He died about a decade ago. But he was backed up by an NRC whistleblower, Dr. Ross Landsman, who is still living and we're hoping to work with him to continue to get the truth out about these whole tech containers, which are the basis of, and Diane will talk about this, the basis of one of the centralized interim storage sites and also deployed at these reactor sites, and they will be a primary shipping container if, if this stuff starts moving. So here are some quotes on the next slide from Oscar. Um, he said, you know, the whole techs are nothing but garbage cans if they violate the rules, which they do. He documented it with his team. It wasn't just him, it was his team of a dozen utilities that documented this. Um, he questioned the whole tech structural integrity sitting still at zero miles per hour in on-site storage, let alone going 60 miles per hour down the rail lines. Uh, it's a high-speed crash into an immovable object. Uh, we'll really test the structural integrity of these. And Dr. Landsman, as I mentioned, he compared the whole techs to space shuttles hitting the ground. And uh, I wanted to put this in there from Palisades. He's been a real ally 
when he was at NRC, he's now retired. He served as our expert witness on this issue of Palisades. The Palisades dry cast storage on the Lake Michigan shoreline is in violation of various aspects of NRC earthquake safety regulations. It's located on a sand dune, 55 feet of loose sand underneath, anchored to nothing. So yes, it's on a three foot thick concrete pad, and I see that Diablo likes to brag about their 7.5 foot thick concrete pad for the dry casks. Uh, but if you have a big enough earthquake at Palisades, the beach could part, the lake could pour in, and these casks could find themselves on the bottom of Lake Michigan. And that could be a problem. And this, this philosophy, this, um, what does he call it, ideology of NRC's Nuclear Materials Safety and Safeguards Division is still operable. This was 1994 when he gave this warning. So here we are, you know, a quarter century later. The NRC is as misbehaved today as they were back then. So Deb Katz, Citizens Awareness Network, um, hammered out the hardened on-site storage philosophy that now is the consensus of the environmental movement in this country. For the most part, there's exceptions, but um, part of her work, and uh, this is an example of one of these mock nuke waste casks that have been hauled back and forth, up and down the coasts, across the country, edu educating people about these transport risks. And this is a cask that we built in Michigan with a lot of irreverent humor on the sides. So um, I want to make this point, uh, as plants like San Onofre enter decommissioning mode, that counterintuitively, the pools, although they should be emptied into hardened on-site storage as close by as possible, the pools themselves should be maintained and not dismantled, and they should be kept operational and ready to go as an emergency plan B if one of the dry casks on site needs to be replaced with a brand new cask. If there's degradation, if there's defects, if there's leakage, you're gonna to need to do that replacement, that transfer somewhere. Once they dismantle the pools, there is nowhere on site to do that. They would have to ad hoc figure out how to do that. So the pools are a ready to go way to do that if necessary down the road. And I should mention, again, Palisades, the fourth cask loaded at Palisades in the summer, June of 1994 was announced immediately to have defective welds. And here it is, what is it, 24 years later, and it's still sitting there fully loaded with defective welds. Because when they went to do the transfer back into the pool, as they promised under oath in court they would do if necessary when we tried to stop the dry cast storage because of lack of planning, they've not done it in 24 years because it's too complicated. So they've left it the way it is. So this is an image from that nuclear waste confidence public um, comment proceeding. You can see Diane Dorigo right there. Um, this is at NRC headquarters. And uh, I wanted to put that up there because how far are we from shutdown now? A few hours from government shutdown. It was an ironic moment of the um, 2013 proceeding that the government shut down for 13 days in the middle of this public comment proceeding on nuclear waste confidence that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has. And the point is, loss of institutional control. We've lost institutional control in real time, present day. I mentioned the defective cask of Palisades. They've lost irradiated fuel at various nuclear plants in this country, including Humboldt. I believe in that case, they, um, they put a cask down in the pool and crushed the, uh, the irradiated fuel beneath it. So loss of institutional control, I believe that's what happened there. I'd have to confirm that. It happened somewhere in the country. So uh, risks of off-site transport, um, these are the major categories, uh, severe accidents, intentional attacks, um, even incident-free routine shipments are going to be hazardous because of the gamma ray emissions coming off of them. And then the crumbling infrastructure in this country combined with these heavy hazardous loads. Next slide. So I, I like this symbol, it kind of says it all. Run away, run for your life. This is uh, Dick Durbin, who's playing, he's the assistant Senate Democratic leader, and he's playing a big role these days on immigration and government shutdown. So this is the 4th of July parade in Evanston, Illinois, and our colleagues there with Nuclear Energy Information Service um, took this picture with our mock nuke waste cask. Uh, he voted the wrong way on the Yucca um, legislation, but he is concerned about the safety of the transportation. So we're gonna have to work with congressional allies on this stuff. And uh, I just wanted to point out that high burnup makes all this all the worse. Low burnup, back in the old days, what it means is they leave uh, irradiated fuel 
that is higher enriched in the reactor cores longer to save money, less, uh, less frequent refueling outages. And so the radioactivity levels and the thermal heat are all the worse. And that's going to exacerbate all these problems I'm describing and all the risks. And this is an image from National Geographic, German irradiated nuclear fuel shipments, where they have massive protests. <laughs> the centralized interim storage facility in Germany, in Gorleben, Germany, which was coincidentally right next to the proposed geologic repository site that's essentially been canceled. Uh, would generate the largest protests in Germany. It was the, it was the heartbeat of the anti-nuclear movement in Germany for decades on end, and uh, led to, ultimately, the nuclear phase out in Germany, which will be completed by 2022. Those protests against these very issues. So this is a cutaway, and the question is, you know, they, they refer to these shipping containers as robust, but are they robust enough? And that's, that's the big question. There's various levels, uh, layers of structural material, neutron absorbing materials, etc. But will it survive these severe crashes if they happen, which they will happen given the numbers of shipments? An image to show you a, a rail sized container, which the proposal is mostly rail in the United States. That's what they want to do, although there are some reactors that don't have rail access. And um, Molly and I drove the roads. Uh, a villa, a villa Drive, Avenue, Avenue. a Villa Avenue, Avila Avenue. And um, the curves on that road make it really a question in my mind. Uh, we'll talk about heavy haul trucks. The proposal is to heavy haul truck the waste out of uh, Diablo to the nearest railhead. And those curves on that road I do not think are amenable to a heavy haul, and you'll see why in a future slide. So Dee's going to talk about the centralized interim storage facilities that are proposed. Um, this is images from Yucca. Uh, the political cartoon was when Yucca was canceled in 2010. So, Screw Nevada, 1987, cancellation in 2010. You've got to count the toes for the Yucca zombie. But the Yucca zombie is stirring again as we speak under Trump and the Republicans. And that image over there is Representative John Shimkus, Republican from Illinois, the sponsor of H.R. 3053, the Nuclear Waste Policy Amendments Act of 2018, taking a tour of Yucca at a cost of $15,000 to US taxpayers when they have to open up this canceled project every time they do it so he can show it off, this hole in the ground, a rat hole for money. Um, he's the sponsor, and they're trying to bring it back. So this is an image from back in the day, back in 2002, um, before the big votes in Congress to try to screw Nevada, showing you know highway routes, rail routes through most states in this country. 90% uh, of the reactors and 90% of the waste are in the eastern half of this country. 75% east of the Mississippi. So this is very much east dumping on west. But all of these states are on these transport routes. This is a more recent map by Fred Dilger, who's a consultant to the state of Nevada, and it gives the shipping numbers per state as well. And uh, some states are hit harder than others, but I'll, I'll point out that, look at Southern California, you're catching waste from other states. So whereas some states like Michigan are simply exporting their own waste, there are other states that are transit states. The state of Indiana has no reactors, but they're going to be one of the hardest hit states in the Midwest. Um, California is going to see waste from other states coming through just because of where the rails are and where Yucca Mountain is, if Yucca is the targeted destination. So national shipping numbers. Um, under current law, and like I mentioned, H.R. 3053 would change current law, would increase the allowable amount to be dumped at Yucca. And that bill is mostly about Yucca, although it would authorize these parking lot dumps that Dee's going to talk about. So the current limit for burial at Yucca is 70,000 metric tons, and that breaks down to about 9,500 rail-sized casks, these giant casks that can hold 24 fuel assemblies, 37 fuel assemblies. Uh, a lesser number of truck casks from these reactors that lack direct rail access, over 2,600, they can hold four fuel assemblies. Because of the weight, they have to be limited going down the highways. So one-sixth the size, or even smaller, than these giant rail-sized casks, for a total of over 12,000. But if you do the math, if you extrapolate, <coughs> if you go up to 110,000 tons to be buried at Yucca, which this bill would authorize, you're talking more like, um, you can barely see the numbers here, Nearly 15,000 rail, over 4,000 truck, going on 20,000 shipments. So that's a lot of shipments. It would take many decades 
DOE will admit a quarter century to a half century to get the waste to Yucca. That's under the current law, let alone that expansion. That's a long time, all the more reason to do hardened on-site storage. It's gonna take that long for those reactors in the back of the line to see their waste go away. So California shipment numbers uh, under current law, um, 750 <coughs> rail-sized casks, uh, 850 truck casks, over 1,600 total. The good news is because of the shutdowns in this state and California, California being reactor free by 2025, you won't see those increases, except for that caveat I added in the south. If there are reactors along those routes uh, in states like Texas and others shipping through Southern California to get up to Yucca, you could see increased shipment numbers through your state. So this is uh, one of these centralized interim storage sites. Put this map out for rail that could be used to its site in Texas. Um, groups in Texas hammered out these route maps for that same facility. Next slide. This is um, showing that the two dumps in New Mexico and Texas are very close together, less than 40 miles apart. And my point here is whether it's Yucca in Nevada, whether it's New Mexico, whether it's Texas, these routes are very similar, in some cases identical across the country, especially the further east you get or the further west. So just to show you how out of control the Department of Energy is at this point, they recently began shipping liquid high-level radioactive waste, unprecedented in North American history. They began that last April, despite our best efforts to stop it, including a lawsuit, without so much as an environmental review, not even a low-level environmental review. And they're using a jerry-rigged container designed for solid irradiated nuclear fuel to do this in. What they've done is they've created these little jars and they put the liquid high-level radioactive waste in these stainless steel jars, screw it shut, stick it in this container meant for solid irradiated nuclear fuel, and the proposal is 150 shipments from Canada to South Carolina over the course of like four years, although those numbers may expand. So they're just throwing caution to the wind. And our expert witness, Dr. Gordon Edwards from Montreal, calculated that two fluid ounces, two fluid ounces of this liquid high-level radioactive waste would be enough to contaminate a major urban drinking water supply above Safe Drinking Water Act limits for certain radionuclides like uh, cesium-137. But the courts blessed it. They're like, go ahead, that's fine, without even an environmental review. So those are the kind of risks the Department of Energy is willing to take, and they would be in charge of these shipping campaigns to Yucca, to Texas, to New Mexico. This is the route map, one of the possible routes. Um, that political cartoon was in the Buffalo paper, so I was really proud that we, we got a political cartoon. So you can see um, they're shipping some very dangerous stuff already as we speak. So another uh, high-risk proposal, this happens to be from New York, just again to show you how out of control the Department of Energy's thinking is. They're proposing barging Indian Point's irradiated nuclear fuel past Manhattan on the Hudson River. So could there be a bigger security risk than doing that? I don't know. But there are proposals out here. These are, these are proposals from the 2002 final environmental impact statement on Yucca Mountain. So if they don't do heavy haul truck at Diablo, they would have to do barges or else use the smaller trucks, but they don't want to use the smaller trucks. They want to use the large rail size casks, and that's what Holtecs are, and they've kind of cast their die on that. So the barge shipments would go into Oxnard, and the next slide um, shows, you can't read it, but the uh, design criteria for a underwater submersion, there's only design criteria. These have never been physically tested at full scale. So one of the NRC rules is a, uh, a cask that survives a puncture test, which is a three-foot drop onto a spike, which isn't a very tall drop, for eight hours under three feet of water. That's their submersion. So three feet of water. That's not very deep. And then the other one that is deeper, 656 feet of depth underwater for one hour undamaged. So if there's a, a barge that sinks, what are the chances it won't be damaged? And what are the chances they'd be able to raise it in an hour or even eight hours? These containers weigh 100 tons, maybe even way more than that with these 37 assembly Holtex we're talking about. So this is an actual nuclear heavy haul truck shipment. It's the Big Rock Point reactor pressure vessel, October 2003. Monster truck in front, sometimes there's even a monster truck in back to push. This thing weighed 290 tons in its transport cylinder. 
200 wheels in between. They had several incidents during this heavy haul shipment that was 30 miles to the nearest railhead. They broke an axle on a bridge over a waterway. They had to pull in for an emergency stop into a gas station, which was a school bus unloading zone. So sure enough, kids got off with this radioactive shipment, which is considered low level, but um, they're talking about doing high level shipments by heavy haul. Either that or barge, and that would happen here. So I don't think that the, the curvy roads out there could handle this. There's not the maneuverability to get this out that way, but maybe I'm wrong, or maybe we'll have to expand the road in a big way. So these are the road and rail maps for California that again, the consultant, Dr. Fred Dilger, um, published last July, um, working on behalf of the State of Nevada Agency for Nuclear Projects. Um, <clears throat> and then the next slide will show um, a close-up of Los Angeles. He's only done 20 cities in the country. There are 100 cities impacted by these Yucca Mountain proposals. But you can see, um, my, my short and sweet for this is be careful what you wish for at San Onofre because look where it goes through the LA area. These are rail shipments um, that are not risk-free. So you better know what you're doing before you rush into this, and they don't, and they're trying to rush into this. So um, these are the uh, citations for those maps. They're, they're a great tool, great resource. Um, I wanted to put on here all of the congressional districts that um, Fred Dilger identified as impacted by these most likely routes through California to Yucca. It's the majority of US congressional districts. The asterisks I put on there because these are uh, members of Congress who voted in favor of this bill last June at committee. They're on the committee or they're co-sponsoring. And you can see that some of these folks, next slide, are in districts that will be impacted by these shipments and yet they're, they're asking for it, they, they voted for it. And um, Linda and I were talking at dinner tonight, just the frustration of uh, Representative Carvajal claiming that this legislation has nothing to do with Yucca Mountain. That's what he was told by the sponsor, Shimkus. This bill has everything to do with Yucca Mountain. It's entirely about Yucca Mountain. So the, the deceptions, the misinformation, just to get it through, just to get it into law. Um, these are the spare districts, but I point out the caveat that you know an upwind or upstream accident uh, could impact a downwind district that doesn't have routes through it. So these are the co-sponsors. Um, and this bill is poised for a floor vote. We don't know when. Um, it could have happened last October, but the shooting massacre in Los Vegas took place and the sponsors didn't dare take it to the floor at that point because Nevada is so adamantly opposed. And uh, we've been trying to keep an eye on it and there was just an article before Christmas that said maybe January, maybe February. So if the government is still operating. So I'm coming to the end of my time, I see. Um, I should keep flying through. Um, let's see, co-sponsors. These are the co-sponsors, okay. So um, this is a helpful sheet from Public Citizen that you also can't read, but I want to give you the design criteria that are so inadequate from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. A drop test, a 30-foot drop of a cask onto an unyielding surface, which is the equivalent of a 30-mile-per-hour crash. 30-mile-per-hour crash is not adequate design criteria. The burn test is a 30-minute fire at 1,475 degrees Fahrenheit. Fires burn a lot longer than that in real world accidents at much higher temperatures. So diesel fuel burns 300 degrees hotter than that, for example. And there's a lot of it out there on the roads and rails. The puncture test is a three foot, four inch drop onto a spike of eight inches in length. And then I already told you about the water submersion tests. So here's some real world accidents. A barge collapsed this bridge in Oklahoma on Interstate 40. This did not involve nuclear waste, but it is a proposed route for truck shipments. This is the Baltimore train tunnel fire in July 2001 that burned for three days, probably at a higher temperature than this design criteria for a solid 24 hours, not for 30 minutes. And this also at the time was a proposed route. And right after this happened, the DOE changed the route. We're not going through that tunnel. So, and then the attack scenarios uh, these are various images with a tripod mounted on a vehicle, next slide, shoulder launched, anti-tank weaponry that are all too available on the black market. So one incident in 2014, ISIS overran 
another moderate rebel base in Syria and took all of the anti-tank weaponry, 400 of these things. So yeah, would, they'd have to smuggle it over, but these things are available to the wrong people in the world. And they're powerful enough to, to breach these containers. In fact, there was a test done in June of 1998 at Aberdeen Proving Ground, U.S. Army in Maryland, with a tow anti-tank missile on a German Castor cask, a thick-walled cask, which are much more robust than U.S. casks, much more metal, 15 inches thick, blew a hole through the wall as big around as a grapefruit. That is the escape pathway for radioactivity, especially with a fire involved in the attack. And these are the places in the human body where these various uh, radioactive poisons that could escape transport containers could go to. This is that mobile x-ray machine that can't be turned off phenomenon, and that was Mary Olson from NIRS. Her sister, Lauren, came up with that phrase. So you can see that um, gamma radiation can penetrate um, even thick shielding materials. So the Nuclear Regulatory Commission allows, permits, gamma dose rates coming off of these shipping containers, just like with the on-site dry cast storage. If you're six feet away, NRC allows for one to two chest x-rays per hour. That's 10 millirem per hour at six feet away, gamma radiation, dose rates. If you're right up at the surface of the container, <clears throat> they allow 200 millirem per hour. So that's uh, 20 to 40 chest x-rays per hour. Pretty, pretty significant gamma radiation coming off of these containers. That is incident-free routine shipments where nothing goes wrong. But in addition to that, here in the United States, there are about 50 documented incidents just from uh, 1974 to 1992 of externally contaminated shipping containers with irradiated nuclear fuel. Um, the next slide uh, talks about France where they had an epidemic of externally contaminated high-level waste shipping containers going into the La Hague reprocessing facility. A, third, a quarter to a third of all shipments going in were externally contaminated at an average of 500 times permissible. So I mentioned a chest x-ray per hour, well, 500 chest x-rays per hour at six feet away, that kind of thing. One of them was 3,000 times permissible. So if you have external contamination, it's all the worse. And I just wanted to mention reprocessing. That's in France, that's in New York State. Um, there's a proposal at one of these centralized interim storage facilities in New Mexico to do reprocessing. So that's why they want the waste to move there. They want to make a, a filthy fortune on this stuff. Emphasis on filthy, because reprocessing is filthy radioactive, radioactivity. And this is another repository archive of immense value. The state of Nevada has done a service to the country on, on these issues of the danger of nuclear waste transportation. Granted, they're trying to protect themselves, but they've done a lot of work on this issue. Um, infrastructure collapse, these are 100 plus tons each, these large rail-sized containers. Um, that example I gave of the Big Rock Point, once they got it on the train and shipped it south to South Carolina to bury in a ditch, they had derailments in its wake. In Southeast Michigan, the next train that came along derailed, and in the Carolinas, because this 290 ton load damaged the tracks. So granted, these irradiated fuel shipping containers are more like 100 tons, or at most 150 tons, but they could put multiple ones on the same train. So this is a serious issue with our infrastructure, according to the American Society of Civil Engineers, currently being at a D plus. So this is where the decisions get made, all this uh, wisdom on Capitol Hill, and they're about to shut down the government in a couple hours. Uh, this is a rail route, and I'll show you on the next slide that it goes right past the Capitol. And so whoever's voting in favor of HR 3053 spends their days, at least some of their weekdays, right along one of these routes that would haul irradiated nuclear fuel. And this is John Trudell. Um, I just saw Molly out in New Mexico at the Dismantling the Nuclear Beast, and Diane was there too, um, put on by the Nuclear Issues Study Group in Albuquerque. And uh, I put this slide up of John Trudell from the American Indian Movement. Um, we are aware to starve the beast is our destiny. And this image of the nuclear lobbyist, um, back at the House vote on Yucca in um, May of 2003, I'm sorry, May of 2002, um, I actually saw a Nuclear Energy Institute lobbyist with an envelope of cash 
that he was dispersing to his sub-lobbyists who were lobbying the members of Congress, going up the steps to vote, and granted it was their per diem, probably, I don't know what, 50 bucks, 100 bucks more to buy lunch for their good work that day, and we got blown out of the water. It was over 300 votes to just over 100 votes in favor of the Yucca Dump, overriding Nevada's veto. But it was just such a stark, you know, cold hard cash on the steps of the U.S. Capitol. And that's a lot of what drives this, the campaign contributions, the lobbying that goes on. And I'm sure it'll get announced, but in Chicago, and Molly's on the planning committee, there's going to be a strategy meeting of the grassroots who work on these issues. We have subgroups, Stop Yucca, Stop Centralized Storage, Yes to Harden On-Site Storage. Here's some contacts um, to get more information and knowledge in the planning committee. So uh, if you're interested, please look into it. And um, yeah, here we are. We're now 75 years into the nuclear age, and we don't know what to do with the first cupful. The only solution is to stop making it. For that which exists, hardened on-site storage as close as possible as an interim measure.